Hello there, eighth grade science students. This is Mrs. Geis, and can you believe it? We have made it to the end of the year, guys. We have learned all of the new material that we were supposed to learn this year, and now it is time to start preparing for the EOG. The EOG for eighth grade will be on Friday, May 28th. So we've got some time to prepare, and we have a special Learn Ed notebook for you to help you with preparing to take the EOG. So go ahead and take out your eighth grade science review EOG notebook, and it is pink, purpley color, and let's go ahead and get started. Here we go. So in this review, we're going to cover all of the things that we have talked about this year with the standards listed up here at the top. This unit review is not in the same order that we learned things this year. OK, just wanted to let you know that. But we'll be covering properties of matter, including elements and compounds, mixtures, physical and chemical changes, and conservation of matter. We'll be talking about energy, the unit we just finished, including how we obtain energy, non-renewable sources, renewable sources, and energy that we use for life in our cells. The hydrosphere, that was the unit we started way back at the beginning of the year, including water on Earth, water systems, safety and potability, and water treatment. Earth's history, we will be talking about Earth, planet Earth, rocks and fossils, how we date rocks and fossils, the method, methods that we use and evidence that we have, plate tectonics, as well as changing life forms. In our evolution and diversity of life unit, we will be discussing geologic time, evolution, adaptations, and how we classify organisms. In our biotechnology, we will be talking about DNA and genetics, tools of biotechnology, the benefits of biotechnology, and ethical issues. Health and disease, including disease-causing organisms, Epidemics and pandemics, something we know all too well, right? Food and energy and healthy practices. Ecosystems, including abiotic and biotic factors, resources and interactions, energy flow and the cycling of matter. All right, let's begin. Open up your notebook to page four and we'll begin with properties of matter. We know the atom is the smallest unit of an element. It still has the properties of that element. All matter is composed of atoms. Atoms have mass and occupy space. Atoms of the same element have the same properties. Let's look at this chart for a minute. We have the three parts of the atom, including the proton, the neutron, and the electron. Remember the proton has a positive charge. It is located in the nucleus and its mass is measurable. The neutron, it has a neutral charge. Remember, neutron, neutral. It is located in the nucleus, so it's easy to remember, new, new, new. And its mass is also measurable. The electron has a negative charge. It's found orbiting the nucleus, and its mass, it's so tiny that it has what we call a negligible mass. An element. We know that these are composed of only one kind of atom. They may link with bonds to form molecules. That means they're chemically combined. They compose all substances on Earth, and their structure and atomic makeup determines the properties of different substances. The molecule is the smallest unit of a compound. A compound is two or more atoms chemically combined. Remember, I taught you the trick CCC, a compound is chemically combined. It may only be broken down through a chemical reaction. Mixtures are composed of two or more different substances. These substances keep their own individual properties. They are combined, which means they are physically mixed. But they can also be separated either by filtration or evaporation. We have two main types of mixtures, homogeneous and heterogeneous. A homogeneous mixture has particles of the same size. An example would be a solution. In a heterogeneous mixture, 
we have particles of different sizes. Remember, to think about homogeneous could be lemonade, where it all looks the same. Heterogeneous would be salad dressing, where you can look and see the different layers of the ingredients. Physical properties can be measured without changing chemical properties. So some examples of physical properties are appearance, solubility, density, melting point, boiling point, and so on. A physical change is the change in energy related to either being a solid, liquid, or gas. A phase change is the change in energy Molecular interactions can change. So for example, a solid can melt to become a liquid. A liquid can boil to become a gas. And liquids can freeze to become a solid. Chemical properties. These can only be observed by changing the chemical identity. So for example, we have chemical changes. These occur in a chemical reaction. This, what happens is we have break the, the new bonds, new chemical bonds are formed. Reactions change the atomic arrangement. Remember when we learned about balancing chemical equations, right? We're not creating or destroying any matter, but we are rearranging. The atoms rearrange to form new compounds. Chemical changes may cause bubbles, odors, the formation of a precipitate, heat, or a color change. All of these indicate that you've had a chemical change occur. All physical and chemical changes involve a change in energy. Chemical reactions. This is the recombination of atoms to form new molecules. So for example, CH4 plus 2O2, this arrow tells us that a chemical reaction has occurred and the products are CO2 and 2H2O. So we have methane combined with oxygen. It gives us or yields carbon dioxide and water. This side of the equation, these are known as our reactants. Remember the RAP model? Reactants, arrow, and then these are the products, P for products. The conservation of matter tells us that atoms in the reactants are rearranged to form the products. So no mass has been created or destroyed. In a closed system, remember, gases are not released to the atmosphere. The mass of the products is going to equal the mass of the reactants. The periodic table, the elements arranged in a grid by Dmitry Mendeleev. Remember, the horizontal rows are called periods. There are seven of those. The vertical columns are called groups. There are 18 of those, and they have similar properties. Here is a picture of our periodic table, thanks to Dmitry Mendeleev. Okay, so make sure to prepare for the EOG that you are familiar with these groups. You want to know, for example, you want to know that the alkali metals, alkaline earth metals, you want to know the transition metals, you want to know the halogens and the noble gases. You want to know that these are the categories because when you are given a periodic table on the EOG, it will not have any answer key with it. Okay, you just have to know that they are grouped in columns according to their similar properties. All right, let's look at each box, each square in the periodic table. We know that the large letter is the element symbol. The number at the top is the atomic number, which is the number of protons in the nucleus. This is how the periodic table is arranged by the atomic number. So if we go back, we start with element number one. Here we have hydrogen. And then we read it across this way. Helium is number two. That means hydrogen has one proton in the nucleus. Helium has two. Then we go to lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, and so on. This number here is, I'm sorry, this number at the bottom is the mass number. That is the atomic mass of that element. And then here, usually we will have the element name. If you can't remember what the symbol stands for, don't worry, there's your element name. The following chart highlights the major properties of metals, metalloids, and nonmetals in the periodic table. 
So metals, they are, we have the reactivity. We have reactive metals and less reactive metals. These conduct electricity and heat and are found in groups one and two. The less reactive metals conduct electricity and heat and some examples would be the transition metals. Metalloids are sometimes reactive. They are fair conductors of electricity, which means they're not the greatest. Boron and silicon would be examples of metalloids. Non-metals are highly reactive. They are a, we have highly reactive ones and non-reactive ones, excuse me. The highly reactive ones are poor conductors of electricity. They would include examples, chlorine, fluorine, and oxygen. The non-reactive non-metals are poor conductors of electricity for, as, as well, and those would be helium and neon. All right, our next topic is energy. Energy is on page six. Energy is the ability to do work. Why is this important? Well, we have many different types of energy, many different forms of energy, mechanical energy, chemical energy, thermal energy, electrical energy, nuclear energy, and electromagnetic energy. Energy cannot be destroyed. It just gets moved somewhere else. The law of conservation of energy is very similar to the law of conservation of mass or matter, right? Matter or mass can never be created or destroyed. It could, just gets rearranged. The same thing with energy. It cannot be created or destroyed. It just gets moved somewhere else. Often, energy is lost in the form of heat from transfers and transformations. Transfer, one form of energy is moved to an object as the same form. So an example, kicking a soccer ball. The mechanical energy from your leg is moved to the mechanical energy in the ball. Transformation is when we have one form of energy is converted to a different form. So for example, chemical energy stored in a battery is transformed to mechanical energy in a remote control toy car. Humans use large amounts of energy to fuel our modern life and our conveniences. This increased need for energy due to advanced technology and mass markets is something we have discussed a lot in class. Different types of fuels have different environmental impacts. Think of some examples. We talked about them in class. Renewable energy versus non-renewable energy. What impact do they have on the environment? How reliable are they? Non-renewable energy used more quickly than can be made or produced. What are some examples? Remember, we discussed fossil fuels such as natural gas and petroleum and coal. We also talked about nuclear energy. Nuclear energy is considered non-renewable because of its dependence on uranium. Disadvantages, someday they could run out, right? It is expensive to obtain them and burning fossil fuels causes higher levels of pollution. Renewable energy can be produced or harnessed without much limit. What are some examples? Wind, solar, biomass, geothermal, hydropower. Advantages, many of these are available indefinitely, right? We're not gonna run out of them. They cause zero or limited pollution. An example, using hydropower sometimes means taking up a large area of land and possibly disrupting habitats. That is a disadvantage. It's important to remember that renewable energy sources do have disadvantages as well. They are costly and can be hard to efficiently harness the energy or store it. Also remember, they rely on ideal conditions. If you're relying 100% on solar power, it's not going to work at nighttime or on cloudy or rainy days. Solar energy is harnessed from the sun. The sun has more energy than the earth even needs, but it is difficult to capture and store it. The following tools transform solar energy into electric energy. The photovoltaic cell, this changes light to electric energy. The light causes electrons to move, causing an electric current. The solar battery stores energy from the photovoltaic cells. The solar reflector concentrates solar rays to make an electric current. We imitated this when we made our solar ovens using a pizza box tin foil, black paper, and saran wrap. Solar reflectors, 
and solar energy can be used for industrial purposes. Confining or trapping solar energy presents challenges though. It is possible to heat water by passing it through collectors and keeping it in isolated containers. For example, it's a great way to heat water for a house. Think about how this might work. The hydrosphere, go ahead and turn your page in your notebook to page eight. Water we know is has the chemical formula H2O. It is one of the most common substances on planet Earth. It is circulated by a process known as the water cycle. Water is a solvent. That means it dissolves minerals and gases to transport to oceans. Surface water moves into river basins from watersheds. The water cycle recycles water over the entire Earth. Remember, water is matter. Matter can never be created or destroyed. And we see this in the water cycle. Let's talk about the different parts or the different phases of the water cycle. We have evaporation, where liquid changes into a gas when it's exposed to heat. This moves water into the atmosphere. Transpiration occurs in plants. Water is released into the atmosphere through the pores of the plants. This moves water into the atmosphere. Condensation is when gas changes to a liquid. So for example, up in the clouds, right? They become too full. They, are, they need to, uh, precipitation happens so that the water can fall back to earth. Evaporated water condenses and it be, turns into precipitation. Precipitation is when the water actually does fall to the earth in the form of rain, snow, sleet, hail, etc. The effects is re it remains on the surface or underground. Most rain and over half of Earth's oxygen comes from the ocean. Aquatic life is extremely dependent upon energy. Ocean life includes food webs from microbes to large carnivores. Remember salinity measures the level of salt in the water. So salinity, salt, that's a good way to remember salinity. Erosion, volcanoes, reactions at the seafloor and the atmosphere all can cause salinity to increase. Marine ecosystems, remember I told you when you see the word marine, I want you to think of saltwater ocean ecosystems, okay? Marine ecosystems, we have the shore, the open ocean and the deep ocean. We have different zonation patterns caused by the tides, waves and predation. This influences life distribution, the location and availability of life. Most of life in the ocean includes microbes in the form of algae. They are our primary producers in the ocean. They are the most abundant life form found in the ocean and they produce oxygen and food Water and aquatic life make resources available. Upwelling occurs when an ocean current, for example, colder nutrient rich waters rise up. Important, this is extremely important for marine life in the ocean. Do you remember why? Remember many ocean uh, fish, marine mammals will actually migrate to off, off the coast of New England in the summer off of the East Coast in the Atlantic because of the amount of upwelling, right? Those offshore breezes, I'm sorry, the, the shore, the breeze is coming off the shore, blowing that water farther out to sea causes the colder nutrient rich water to upwell from the bottom. And it, pro it provides a perfect smorgasbord of feeding for a lot of different animals. Water in North Carolina. So we researched river basins of North Carolina and the, and these are the estuaries to which they, and, and excuse me, the estuaries to which they drain into, as well as some of the lakes of North Carolina. Remember, we talked about the Noose River Basin, Pamlico Sound, Cape Fear River and River Basin, Lake Norman, and Lake Matamuskeet. The health and water safety are an important part of the hydrosphere. We have physical, chemical, and biological variables. So physical includes temperature, turbidity, remember how cloudy or clear the water is, and the movement of water. Chemical variables include dissolved oxygen levels, salinity levels, nitrates, how many nitrates are present, remember, nutrification, and the pH level. 
Biological variables include habitats, population, and diversity. What is a bioindicator? Remember, it's a living organism that indicates the health of the water system. Bioindicators show water quality, including water flow, pollution, and vegetation. Some bioindicators are very sensitive and will not be present if pollution is present. Let's look at some important events in the, the hydrosphere unit that we discussed. Uh, in 1914, drinking water standards for wells to test for coliform, a deadly bacteria, became more, more and more present in our nation. In 1940, drinking water standards for city water became implemented. In 1970, the focus on harmful effects of pollution, including aeration, flocculation, and carbon absorption were studied. In 1972, we had the Clean Water Act became law in the United States. The 19, in 1974, the Safe Drinking Water Act became law. In the 1980s, we became more adept at using reverse osmosis, re, excuse me, reverse osmosis as a water purification technique. This is especially important in areas, uh, coastal areas where salt water, where the water table um, is oftentimes infiltrated by salt water. And in 1990, risk ass assessments, the right to safe drinking water became more the norm as we realized the importance of having safe drinking water for everyone in our country and our world. Earth's history, we are now on page 10. Let's go ahead and dive in. The study of the history of the Earth has led scientists to many discoveries about life, including the Earth's composition. It is composed of layers that provide evidence about Earth history. The crust is the outermost part of the lith it's the outermost and part of the lithosphere. The mantle is the middle part. It includes magma and convection. And the core has the, is the innermost part. And it is, has iron and nickel present. Here you can see, whoops, excuse me. Here you can see the different parts of the earth. A fault is a dislocation in a break of the crust. This is caused by the shifting of the crust. Fault types include movement from pressure along faults and may cause earthquakes. One side of, fault could, of the fault could move up, one side of the fault could move down. Plates can slide past each other sideways. How does this relate to earthquakes? How does an earthquake occur? Rocks break, rock breaks along a fault, releasing energy into the form of seismic waves. This is what causes the ground to quake. The rocks of Earth provide insight to Earth history. They may use absolute or radioactive or even relative dating to determine the age of the rock. Igneous rock is made from molten materials on or below Earth. Metamorphic rock is made from a change in one type to another. Sedimentary rock is made from deposited sediments or minerals. Sediments and remains of organisms are deposited and merged together forming solid rock or fossils. This is where we find fossils. Fossils show how life and earth has changed over time. Remember our geologic timeline? The law of superposition tells us that older rock is found below younger rock in sedimentary rock. This is known as relative dating. You are looking at how old a rock is in comparison with other rocks or fossils. More recent fossils are found in shallower rock layers, indicating more recent species. Older fossils are found in deep rock layers, usually showing older species. The most recent layer may not always be on top because of folding and breaking occurring. The geologic time scale describes the history of Earth beginning with the Earth's formation. The divisions of time, there are four major divisions used to organize our Earth history. The eon, the longest division of time, there are four total eons. Era 
is the division of an eon split by mass extinctions. The period is the division of an era shown by rock layers and the epoch is the division of a period, the smallest division. Here are some examples. We have the eon would be Phanerozoic, the era, eon, Phanerozoic, the era, Cenozoic, the Quaternary Period, and the Holocene Epoch. Dating methods. We have two methods that help us determine age of rock and geologic events. These are relative and absolute dating. Relative dating, e relative equals superposition. Absolute would be carbon-14 or radioactive. Uranium, mildly radioactive, breaks down at a steady rate. This allows scientists to estimate the age of the Earth, which is about 4.6 billion years old, give or take a few hundred million years. Earth history provides evidence, such rocks, fossils, ice cores, and geological data. So rocks and fossils give us relative history of life. Ice cores give us evidence of Earth's atmosphere and plant life. Geological dating uses techniques to infer age and history. Diversity of life on page 12. Earth history provides evidence for gradual changes of living and non-living things. The theory of evolution tells us a gradual change in a species over time based on natural selection. Remember our study of Darwin and his finches and other organisms? Plate tectonics theory, this is the movement of plates that give evidence of Earth's changing format. For example, mountains, trenches. The law of superposition tells us that older rock is found below younger rock and gives relative ages. Biological evolution throughout Earth's history. Organisms that were best adapted survived and were able to pass on their genes to their offspring. Adaptation, remember that? It's a beneficial trait that increases survival or reproductive success in a species. Changes to Earth and their effects on biological evolution. So we've had sea level changes, the change in the continental shelves, seas, landforms, land, volume, ice caps, etc. Plate movements contribute to these sea level changes, changes in climate and geography. Living things evolve in response to changes. Biological evolution leads to genet genetic diversity. Differences among organisms beneficial for continuation. Changes in phenotype gives the greater chance of survival. Similarities among organisms may indicate related species. So look at this chart. We have evidence, description, and significance. So we know that homologous structures are structures from the same tissue types, but used differently in different organisms. They have anatomical similarities. Analogous structures are similarly, similarly formed structures that do not share the same evolutionary origin. They have cellular and anatomical evidence. Embryology, or the study of embryos of different species, different species show striking similarities as developing embryos, as you will see in the next slide. They have a shared embryological characteristics as evidence. Fossils are preserved remains of once living organisms. These indicate evolutionary changes throughout history. And then we have DNA evidence. DNA-based sequences are most more similar in closely related organisms. The significance is the degree of relatedness. So look at the similarities in these structures. We have, it looks like a human, a dog, a whale, and a bat. Look at these embryos. We have a turtle, a fish, and a human. At this stage of development, they look strikingly similar. So classification. This is the science of grouping organisms based on shared characteristics. We call this science taxonomy. The diversity of life. No two organisms have the same genetic code. Your DNA is different from all other humans. The only exception to this is identical twins.
identical, not fraternal. Many beneficial adaptations allow living organisms to be incredibly diverse. Think about why is this important? Research at least three adaptations that have allowed organisms to evolve and to be more successful over time and use this information to fill in the chart on page 13. Think about the finch beaks that we studied with Darwin and his work in the Galapagos Islands. All right, biotechnology. That was an exciting unit. Let's go ahead and turn to page 14 for biotechnology. Biotechnology is a rapidly growing field involving the use of living organisms to modify genes. Biotechnology has given us advances in medicine, food, genetics, and agriculture. In order to understand how biotechnology works, you must understand DNA. We know DNA, which stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, is the blueprint for life. It contains all the genetic information for life. Here is a model of DNA. Do you remember the parts? Remember we made 3D DNA in class together. Here we have our hydrogen bonded bases, our base pairs, our sugar phosphate backbone, right? And remember, adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine. Those are the parts right there. Your traits and characteristics are determined by your genes. DNA makes up genes which code for traits. All living organisms have DNA and genes. Here we go. Parents transmit their genes to their children by producing sex cells, known as gametes, that contain half of their genetic information. When fertilized with a gamete from the opposite sex, a complete organism is formed. Here we have our sperm cell. 23 chromosomes, the haploid male gamete has one copy of each chromosome pair. The cell is produced by meiosis. It joins up with the egg cell. It has 23 chromosomes. The haploid female gamete has one copy of each chromosome pair. The cell is produced by meiosis. The fertilized zygote, we have 46 chromosomes. Two haploid gametes fuse to form one diploid cell the first cell of an organism. This will divide by mitosis. And then finally, we have the blastocyst. This is 46 chromosomes in each cell, divides by mitosis to form an embryo within days and a fetus within weeks. DNA is manipulated using techniques in biotechnology to create a beneficial outcome. For example, in healthcare, it is used to treat genetic disorders and certain diseases. An example, making penicillin to treat infections. Transgenic engineering to produce insulin from bacterial DNA. The human gene for insulin production is transferred into a bacterial plasmid DNA, which then allows the bacterial cell to produce insulin. Think of how is this beneficial? New techniques are emerging to treat cancers and many inherited conditions. Cystic fibrosis and SCIDS, which is an immune deficiency or system disorder, are just a few. Crime scene investigation. Remember, we talked about forensic science in bi biotechnology. That uses DNA uh, for testing and study of a crime scene. It can exonerate or it can help to uh, put criminals away. Agriculture is another area of biotechnology. It is used to develop beneficial crops. The resistance to frost or freezing and pests are important in agriculture. Because biotechnology is rapidly advancing, many new careers are available, benefiting the local economy. Can you think of some examples? We discussed here in North Carolina, we have the Research Triangle Park, the area uh, in Durham and Raleigh and Chapel Hill, where scientists come from all over the world to study and make improvements in biotechnology. Many ethical issues surround the field of biotechnology. Which do you feel presents the largest challenge? Complete the diagram on page 15 by comparing the pros and cons of biotechnology. There's a Venn diagram. Health and disease. We're getting to the home stretch, guys. Only a couple more. This one. 
and ecosystems, and then we're done with our review. <clears throat> Microbiology involves the study of microbes, many of which cause infections and diseases. This includes the study of bacteria, parasites, viruses, fungi, algae, and protozoa. All are living organisms except viruses. So let's look at the microbe, the description, and some examples. First of all, we have viruses. These are non-living. They are capable of replicating inside host, the host and spreading rapidly. This would include AIDS, influenza, common, the common cold, chickenpox, smallpox, and of course, the coronavirus. Bacteria, these are living prokaryotic organisms and they cause infections. They must be treated with antibiotics. Some examples, rabies, Lyme disease, bacterial meningitis, leprosy. I'm sure that many of you have had an infection at some time in your life and the doctor has prescribed antibiotics for you. It's important to only take the antibiotics prescribed by your doctor for the length of time that your doctor prescribes them. Fungi, these are spread easily in moist places and they interfere with normal body, bodily functions. For example, ringworm and athlete's foot, you may have experienced those unpleasant fungal infections. Parasites. Parasites feed off of a host, often infecting them with harmful diseases or they cause the disease themselves. African sleeping sickness would be an example of a parasite. Protozoa, these are single-celled animal-like organisms that may be transferred by a vector, such as a mosquito. Plasmodium causes malaria. Let's look at microscopic prokaryotic bacteria. A disease, any condition that disrupts the normal functioning of processes within an organism. A pathogen is any disease causing microorganism or particle. An infection occurs when any organism becomes contaminated by a disease causing agent. Disease outbreaks may spread rapidly through populations. Epidemics are when we have large outbreaks that are not worldwide. They occur in large populations. So for example, malaria is a threat in Africa, but not worldwide, not globally. A pandemic would be a large outbreak occurring globally, such as the flu or the current coronavirus outbreak. Human health depends on a balanced diet and regular exercise. Food, we know, is needed for energy. Which types of food give you the most energy? If you're an athlete, you know that you eat certain types of foods before certain events. They will give you quick energy or more sustained energy, depending on your sport. Carbohydrates, these are quick energy providers, such as sugars and starches. It is found in fruit, pasta, potatoes. This gives us the quickest energy source for living things. It is able to be metabolized and broken down to simple sugars for energy. Lipids. These are long-term energy storage, such as fats and oils. Needed, these are needed by your body to regulate temperature, compose cell membranes, and protect your organs. Proteins are used for growth and repair. These make up your tissues in your body, and they are found in meats, yogurt, and eggs. All provide calories, which is food energy. Metabolism refers to the set of chemical reactions that break down food to store and to use energy. Food provides nutrients, but it must be oxidized to carry out cellular respiration to make ATP. Remember, adenosine triphosphate. The basal met metabolic rate, the BMR, refers to the amount of energy needed to carry out the minimum tasks for survival. Energy use in the body is broken down as follows. 60% is just for our basal metabolic rate just our basic energy are needed for our bodily functions. Okay, 30% is our daily physical activities. It's what's needed to get up out of bed, to walk, to take a shower, um, to do all of the things that we do during the day. And then 10% is needed for digestion and processing of food. All right, guys, this is it. Our last unit in our review, ecosystems. We are on page 18 in our notebook. Let's begin. Ecosystems are affected by food, water, and shelter. Think about it, what is a habitat, right? A habitat is a place where organisms live. It is specialized for that organism. Organisms may compete for these resources, such as food, water, and shelter, 
if they are limited. Energy is needed to fuel all ecosystems and everything we've learned this year, everything goes back to the sun, right? We can trace every single bit of energy or food web or food chain back to the sun. This can change forms in living things. Energy can change forms in, in living things and food is oxidized. Energy is released as heat. Life relies on food webs. There are two major food webs. They begin with microscopic ocean producers, which we know to be algae. And on land, it begins with terrestrial plants. So aquatic food webs, terrestrial food webs. Explain how food web functions in the space. How, excuse me, explain how a food web functions in the space provided on page 18. Plants in an ecosystem, they are known as producers. They are the first step in a food chain or food web. We call them autotrophs. They make their own food. They contribute to the energy flow and, ex which, and they exist at the bottom. They are extremely important for all life. So we take energy from the sun, right? The autotrophs take that energy. They, through photosynthesis, are able to produce and give off glucose, give out glucose, produce glucose and oxygen. Heterotrophs, these are consumers. We have, for example, this rabbit is going to eat the grass and get its energy from the grass, which got its energy from the sun. The snake might eat the rabbit, which got its energy from the grass, which got its energy from the sun. And then we have decomposers. These break down matter. These are, they rely on dead and decayed material to get their energy. So again, autotrophs make their own food, they get their energy from the sun, and they provide energy for consumers, the animals that consume them. They have a role in transpiration. They use and release moisture back into the environment, and this is present in the water cycle. They photosynthesize, they are photosynthetic. In addition to making their own food, they also release oxygen into the atmosphere. This provides oxygen, oxygen for other living organisms. Animals in an ecosystem, for example, we have consumers. They consume energy from other organisms. They are, can be heterotrophs. They contribute to ecological balance, such as competition, cooperation, predator-prey relationships, symbiosis, and many others. So let's look at consumers. They depend on levels uh, below for a source of energy. They use food energy and provide it for higher levels. They, the coexistence that they exhibit is living together in the same, split, same space. The competition, symbiosis, predator-prey relationship is all evident. They, advanced organisms, animals range in complexity from simple to very advanced. Each, each, single, each organism has a role or a niche in life has an important role in life. Remember we call that the niche or the niche. Symbiosis is a close association between two different species. Mutualism, for an example, this is ants, for example, and acacia trees. The ants get food and shelter. The tree gets protection. Parasitism, for example, a tick and a dog. The tick harms the host, but does not kill it. So mutualism is when both benefit. Parasitism is when one is harmed while the other benefits. Think about commensalism. Do you remember what commensalism is? Energy and matter move throughout ecosystems. It can't be destroyed. It's always recycled. Research each of the cycles below. Why are they significant to the functioning of ecosystems? How do they represent recycling of materials? Water, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. Here you have a diagram of the water cycle. I would go ahead and label this and be familiar with the water cycle. Make sure you know all of the names such as evaporation, condensation, precipitation, runoff, collection, and so on. That is it, guys. I encourage you to look at your 
properties, um, um, excuse me, your uh, vocabulary list that beginning on page 20 and going in your notebook all the way through page 27. I also encourage you to look back at your notebooks that we've completed throughout this year. Please take time to review. Don't try to do it all the day before the EOG. That will not be helpful. But if you do a little bit each day, like maybe take two or three days to review terms from each of our units, then you can relax and know that you'll be prepared for the EOG. Thank you so much and have a great day and good luck on your test. It's your time to shine.